Well, thank you very, very much. Let me welcome each and every one of you. This is a series of briefings we've been doing for years now. I want to thank our partners uh, with uh, AAAS uh, and the Dana Foundation. And I want to thank all of you for taking time to uh, share in, I mean, some breakthrough discoveries that are going to be talked about today in neurotechnology. I want to welcome uh, Dr. Cardwell, uh, Joshi, and I also want to welcome Dr. Ludwig. I want to especially acknowledge uh, my friend, uh, Philip Lowe, who is just uh, extraordinary. And we shared uh, a, a keynote at the uh, Israeli Brain Technology Conference. Uh, but we also, as with everyone here, uh, we share an interest in dealing with the challenges for the over one billion people in our world who suffer from a brain illness. Uh, some 50 plus million Americans uh, who suffer from one of the 600 plus diseases or disorders of the brain. And the hope really rests in what is going to be discussed today, neurotechnology. And we've done some real work here in the Congress as part of the a Fatah Neuroscience Initiative. I've made this the principal focus of my work as the lead appropriator on science uh, and working with uh, my chair people uh, on the uh, other team, uh, Culberson, chairman of the CJS, and Tom Cole from Oklahoma, who is the uh, chairman of the Labor Health Education Appropriations Subcommittee. We have worked together to uh, really put neuroscience at the very forefront of the country's uh, work and, and invested billions of dollars in this effort uh, through the National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health. At the foundation, we created the Interagency Working Group on Neuroscience through legislation some five years ago. And then we followed that with a new uh, Interagency Working Group on Imaging. But what you're going to hear about today is what this portends, what's happening right now, how people who who have family members who are suffering from epilepsy and uh, MS and uh, Alzheimer's, where the promise rests in terms of neural technology, the fact that uh, literally there are well over 10 million people who now have a device uh, in their brain and helping to help them manage uh, some of the challenges of day-to-day -day life and to be self-sufficient, but how so much more is going to be able to be done. So we're building, uh, working with our national labs, a national brain observatory. Um, this is an important effort. NIH and the National Science Foundation and DARPA are doing great work, uh, working together on uh, the developing the tools that are going to be needed to map the brain, to understand how it works, uh, and to be able to uh, uh, make disruptive progress in this area. So many people and so many families depend on the success uh, that is uh, the focus of this work. And it's not being done by politicians. It's being done by the people who you're going to hear from now. These are some of the smartest, most capable people anywhere in the world who are focused on the greatest scientific challenge that exists in the world. You know, uh, we have a lot going on in between our ears. You know, 100 billion neurons and trillions of connections. And we yet don't understand how the simplest task that our brain undertakes really work. And we need the tools to be able to master that. And you're going to hear today about how federal investment, working together with those in academia and in the private sector, efforts like the, the Neurozone in San Diego uh, that's being led uh, by uh, some of the, the two of our guests who are here to talk today. You're going to hear about this work. But rather here in Philadelphia or anywhere in the world, this is the work that I think is the most important effort that we need to be undertaking for the benefit of humankind. So thank you and enjoy this briefing, and I look forward to being with you at our next one. Thank you very, very much. Terrific, so we're gonna go ahead and, and launch right into it. Um, I'm going to give very brief introductions because uh, the folks that are speaking today are much better at talking about themselves than I am um, and their work and, and uh, all that they do. So we're gonna start right from the top. We're gonna go Dr. Kip Ludwig, who is the Associate Director of the Mayo Neural Engineering Laboratories. So, Dr. Ludwig. All right. So, first of all, very happy to be here. This is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. I'm only uh, seven months at the Mayo Clinic. Before that, I was the program director for neural engineering at the National Institutes of Health. 
and actually led the development of two public-private partnerships, one for the Brain Initiative and one for a program called Spark that I'll talk a little bit about. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the Connectome, but the Connectome is our attempt to map the 100 billion neurons in the brain. Now, this isn't a functional map, and as you see, if you look through the slides, on the far right, it's about the resolution we can get to with non-invasive technology. And when you look at these wires, you don't see 100 billion because we don't have the technology right now to get to that level of detail. We have these gross maps, and we don't know what to do with them. But there's also limitations. So the brain has 100 billion wires, but they go to all the organs in your body. And one of the things that we have not invested much in um, in the US or in the world is understanding the connections between your brain and the organs and how they function. Secondly, we're not measuring the signals that these wires are passing. And we need to not only be able to say these connect from A to B, but we need to know what electrical signal is passed. And why is that important? Well, technology is developing. So how many here have heard of the cardiac pacemaker? This is what the cardiac pacemaker looked like in 1930s. It was literally a hand pump system where they stuck a needle in the chest and then the surgeon would actually crank it to create the charge to, to defibrillate the heart. In the 50s, they got more, it got better. And this is the Zoll pacemaker. Get some static here. This, as of two months ago, was the state of the art. This is what we got to, which is a minimally invasive system where they take a electrode and they snake it in through a vein in your chest and they snake it into the heart, but then they have these leads that come back to a battery that's placed in your chest. And as of two months ago, there was a huge FDA approval that I think changes the game for neurotechnology, and it's the Medtronic Microsystem. What this is is a completely wireless device that's about the size of your fingernail that can last in the body for 10 years. It can electrically activate nerves, but more importantly, it can record from those nerves. So instead of just delivering electrical stimulation, it can sense what the body's doing and titrate therapy exactly the way you want it. And this is really important in terms of these functional maps because it enables therapies that have never existed before. And this is the basis behind an effort that was started by GlaxoSmithKline, which they originally called electroceuticals. The idea is that these devices are getting so minimally invasive, they're coming to the point where they're injectable, where you can go to a doctor and get a shot and have it control your nervous system. And the great thing about your nervous system is any drug that works in your body, your, or any drug at all, if it works, it's because your body already makes it. It's because there's already receptors for it. But the problem is, when you take a pill, you're delivering a drug to your entire body. If we hijack the nervous system, which was the subject of, uh, this is, I guess, a nice way they put it uh, on the cover of the New York Times when this came up, hijacking or hacking the nervous system, we can teach the body to deliver its own intrinsic drugs exactly where you want it, when you want it. It's the ultimate in precision and personalized medicine. It's precision medicine because it's exactly where you want it and you can put these little devices to deliver it only where it's at and they don't need to be refillable because it's teaching the body to deliver its own drugs more effectively. Uh, but it's personalized because these have sensors on them and they can sense your drug status throughout the day and titrate therapy exactly based off the patient's need. Now, the interesting thing, although GlaxoSmithKline thought they invented this concept, it's actually been around for forever. The cardiac pacemaker is being one of the examples of these closed-loop therapies. Um, it's already, it's projected to be a $6.5 billion U.S. industry by 2020, these neuromodulation devices. Keep in mind, pharma is about a trillion dollars worldwide in sales. Medical devices is about 300 billion. The NIH has less than 5% of its, uh, its budget spent on medical devices, and medical devices are growing at a much faster rate than pharma. Um, the other am amazing thing about technology is that it leverages Moore's law. These get smaller, they get better. 10 years, 20 years from now, you're, you're not gonna be able to see these devices, but they're going to be able to, without risk to the patient, stimulate the nerves that you want and record from them. Now, the amazing thing, me coming from the National Institutes of Health, what I can tell you is a lot of drugs have failed large clinical trials uh, in recent years. We haven't had truly new drugs hit the market in a while, 
But we've had a slew of FDA approvals for these neural technologies that stimulate the nervous system. We've had micro, which I just showed you, neuropaces for intractical e epilepsy, second sight, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. That's for blindness. Inspire, for sleep apnea. CVRX Neo, which is for hypertension and heart failure. Intera 2, which is for gastroparesis. Intera Medics, which is for uh, obesity that's not manageable. Nevro, Axiom, and Stimwave are already wireless systems to some extent that stimulate for chronic pain. They've already passed clinical trials in the US, the highest standard of clinical evidence that exists in sham controlled, double blinded, randomized studies showing that they help the patients. But the problem is, we don't know how these devices work. We're actually just randomly sticking in wires with some idea of where the current is going and activating these wires. And we're sticking in a couple at a time to get these effects. But it's amazing the effects that you can get to things that just were not responsive to drugs. And I'm gonna show you a couple of quick videos so you can see how powerful this is. This is a patient who was a concert violinist who had something called essential tremor. His tremor was so bad he could no longer do his job and I'm gonna let him talk about it, but he has this four-wire lead placed into his brain to address I started his symptoms. playing right away, the day I came home uh, from Mayo. I was uh, back playing with uh, my colleagues with the Minnesota Orchestra three weeks later. Without the stimulator on, um, the, the tremor is quite pronounced. You can see the difference. With the click of a controller, Roger can turn the electrodes on and off. And that's as smooth of a bow as I can play right now. But when it's on, Roger's mastery of the violin is absolutely clear. I remain very, very thankful every day that I have had the opportunity to have had this surgery. So I'm going to show you another video. In full disclosure, this device you're about to see, I actually developed an industry. I have no financial ties to this. I actually had to give up my financial ties to take my government position so that I could lead funding in this area. Um, but what this is, is for hypertension and heart failure. When you get become hypertensive, a lot of the reason is because signals from your arteries aren't being sent to your brain that normally are sent that tells your brain to send a signal back to open up your arteries. Unfortunately, 25% of the US population is hypertensive. Roughly half of them can't manage the condition. And in heart failure, if you have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, there's a roughly a 70% mortality rate within five years. We can't treat it with drugs worth a darn at all. This is a patient who's been implanted with this device, which is injectable. It's actually under a half centimeter, and it's placed on the carotid. And the beauty of these devices, unlike drugs, you can turn them on and off. So this is a patient, he's 171 over 88, he's just been turned on and he doesn't know it. This is the blood pressure trace. It's already starting to go down, watch the numbers. Completely unresponsive to drugs for decades. And we're not done yet. Eighty-five over forty-six, repeatable. Now we turn it off. The great thing about it, it's electricity. I can titrate it. If I want them to be a hundred over eight or over seventy, a hundred and ten over seventy-five, I can adjust the dial. It's that manageable. To be honest with you, it only works this well in about ten to fifteen percent of patients. We don't know why, because we don't know exactly what we're stimulating for effect. We don't have these functional maps that are critical for us taking these minimally invasive devices and growing the economy. And here's the last one. This is at least a more advanced device. This is the Second Sight Argus II. This is a patient who is blind from retinitis pigmentosa. This is the first time he'll see his wife in about 10, 15 years. And this is an advanced version where because the signal is no longer getting to his eye, going to his brain, they have 64 wires instead of four or eight. And instead of being HDTV, there's a little image on the right that's hard to see. These glasses can essentially create an Atari image for him, just a couple of pixels. But it's enough. If you look very closely at the computer, you're going to see the picture that he sees of his wife. 
Um, there. Yeah. yeah. What do you see? <laughs> ready to put those on? I'm ready. Okay. Here we Uh, I, I want to, like, if I were to blink or close my eye. Okay. 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 So, Something's over there. Yep. Can you look straight ahead now? Can you see the difference? So then it's useful. Oh, <laughs> we need a longer kiss for the camera. <laughs> <laughs> All right, longer kiss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I can see with my eyes closed. <laughs> He's not joking. He can literally see with his eyes closed. Because the electrodes are behind the eyelid and it's being wirelessly transmitted by the camera, he can close his eyes, still have the camera see things, electrically stimulate, and see. So he can literally see with his eyes closed. And that's the sort of things that neural technology is starting to make happen on a routine basis. So me having developed public-private partnerships for the government, one of the things I was asked is, why doesn't this happen in industry spontaneously? Me having come from the medical device industry and developed one of these products, it makes me laugh my rear end off to hear that. And let me tell you why. It's a hundred billion wires. There's no company that's going to map a hundred billion wires. And all the signals and all the knowledge. This is something that is a huge project. The other problem is, still the best way to map these wires is to stick a wire by it. That means surgical opportunities. That means you can only get really good data with, uh, when the signal's going by when, when there's already cut downs for another procedures. That's why I went to Mayo, because we have all the clinical procedures in the world to start doing this functional mapping. The other problem is we need better tools. We can't be mapping these nerves, and we're going to see some great technology um, from two more speakers on how to better map these, uh, do it faster, do it cheaper. But the problem is these tools to functionally map aren't a large market. There's only so many people who can use them. But the knowledge will grow an incredible number of markets. It's something that needs government investment. The other real problem is, and this frustrated me to no end when I was in industry, we don't share with each other. We're all caring about IP instead of aggregating all of this data to understand it together. And the problem is, that doesn't make the safest product for a patient by any stretch of the imagination. But the other thing was it was grossly inefficient. I did millions of dollars of studies in industry to get answers that other companies already had. And it's because we didn't want to share with each other because we didn't give, we didn't want to give our competitors any leg up. But now all of industry is seeing how powerful this can be if we work together. If there's incentive, if there's government to help them, they're willing to participate. A lot of these studies though are done in research institutions and it has to be done with industry so that when these results hit and you start seeing things like those videos, they can quickly get to market and be sustainable businesses. And a lot of the researchers don't know how to make that business case. So this really does have to be a true partnership that's never going to happen in isolation. The other really important thing is that microsystem, that wireless system, it's treating, it's treating, um, it's pacing the heart because that's a huge market. But now they're using existing stimulators for things like spinal cord injury. There's no market incentive because there's only 250,000 spinal cord injured in the United States for them to do it. But if the government's willing to say, take your device with proven safety and see if you can stimulate the nerves in these small market conditions, and then you can take that safe technology and expand your market, they're more than willing to do it. They love it. And these are patient populations that have no other opportunity otherwise. So one of the programs I developed is the NIH Spark program. And this is really this idea of what you'd need to do to create these functional maps. Develop multidisciplinary teams, engineers, softwares, clinicians, um, et cetera. Develop new tools so that you can map and not do one wire at a time. Industry partnerships, not only to expand and to understand the business case, but one of the things that we had to do that the government can uniquely do, it takes about two years for a clinical research institution to come to agreement to do a research project with industry, or it can take that long. What we did is we met with most of the contract research officers at research institutions and all of industry to pre-negotiate template contracts with terms that everybody can agree to. 
And then if you're being funded by this program, you use that contract. That saves literally a year to two years in negotiations. And that's something that would never spontaneously develop, but it's all because of belief in what neural technology can do. The problem being, it's incredibly underfunded. So this program got 200 million over seven years to map all of the wires in the periphery. If you have 100 billion wires and you paid one penny to understand the signal for each of those, it would be a billion dollars. The hope is that it's a nice start. The hope is that it shows the value. But this is going to need a lot more funding to realize its potential. And the economic growth, and some of my colleagues will talk about this, is going to be phenomenal. So the Mayo, being a clinical research institution with all the surgical opportunity to, to do um, some of this mapping, is putting on a symposium. And we'd like to invite all of you to it. Um, it's going to happen March 31st through April 2nd, 2017. And it has industry, it has nonprofits that represent these small market indications and these therapies that are needed for really people who don't have uh, industry incentives to develop therapies for. Develop the big data aspects and see how we can work together to make terms so industry is willing to work with government and willing to work with academia to develop these functional maps without all these restrictions. So I'm gonna leave you with this because I do think this is the American moonshot. I do think that this, just like the moonshot led to personal computing in the 80s, investment in this in 20 years, this is what is the economy, this will be the largest sector of the economy, I guarantee it, in 20 years if we put an investment now. But it's, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. If we don't do this, if the US doesn't do this, Japan will do it, China will do it. We won't create the jobs for the US. It is absolutely critical that we lead on this, but it's also something in this diverse culture that we have, it's something we can damn well be proud of together uniquely American. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lugwood. That was fantastic. Um, let's see if I can try and attempt to remove the feedback. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Our next speaker is Dr. Pushkar Joshi, who is the Director and Strategy of Business Development at Inscopix. And without further delay, we'll go ahead and invite him up. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pushkar Joshi. I'm the Director of Strategy and Business Development at Inscopix. Inscopix is a discovery phase company, neuroscience company in Silicon Valley, California. And we are really at the forefront of innovating new technologies and platforms for mapping, for functional mapping of brain circuits that underlie our mental activities and behavior. Um, Inscopix is an industry partner of the uh, of the Federal Brain Initiative since 2014. And in 2015, the World Economic Forum recognized Inscopix as a technology pioneer, um, an honor that it bestows on some of the world's leading young uh, innovative tech companies. Inscopix um, today is best known for its miniature microscope technology Um, for its uh, miniature microscope technology, this microscope, which is the core innovation, which is the size of your fingertip, and that really, in effect, has turned out to be the world's smallest brain observatory to uh, look at the, to spy on the activities of um, nerve cells in living, thinking, working brains. So this work is really crucial for decoding the neural language that underlies our emotions, thoughts, cognition, actions, sensory perception, and behavior. In Scopix, um, it was incorporated in 2011 and it spun out of Stanford University. It actually spun out of this 121-page doctoral dissertation of Kunal Ghosh, who is our CEO and founder, 
while he was a graduate student in the laboratories of Mark Schnitzer and uh, Abbas al Gamal. And it is really important to note for this uh, briefing that this work and subsequent refining of the technology at Inscopix was partially funded by grants from the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, the tune of $1 million. And so I think it's a fair question to ask as to what has been the impact of this $1 million investment in our technology and in our company. And I'm happy to report that since we commenced our commercial operations at the start of 2013, in the last three years, for every $1 on federal investment, and Scopix has returned $20 to the economy. That is the power of these kind of investments. And this return on investment is only going to grow with the passage of time. In terms of job creation, uh, in the beginning of 2013, there were three full-time employees. Today, three years later, there are 45 full-time employees and expected to exceed 60. And these are high quality, stable jobs across the spectrum, across educational backgrounds, from postdocs to undergraduates to somebody with high school diploma, from neuroscientists, physicists, engineers, program uh, managers, product managers, IT specialists, technicians. In terms of uh, manufacturing, Inscopix has actually spurred American manufacturing our systems, the NVISTA system, is assembled in our facility in Palo Alto, California. And it's, it's really intriguing to note that all but two components of the system are actually sourced from US suppliers that manufacture these components in the United States. However, I think that the most profound effect, uh, the, our most profound effect of a company like Inscopix has been to really empower neuroscience discovery, our raison d'etre to really uh, advance neuroscience through entrepreneurship, through capitalistic mechanisms, and through value creation that is born when companies when, uh, go beyond just providing technologies and work hand in hand with researchers in partnership with researchers to create new foundational knowledge. In the last three years, we have disseminated more than 250 systems to over 135 labs across the globe. These include Nobelus, these include HHMI investigators, and most importantly, they also include significantly early career investigators who have that drive to really push the borders um, at the beginning of their career. And it's really uh, important to know that these researchers, this community of researchers has published close to 20 research articles in high profile journals um, that have really shed new light on understanding everything from cognition to feeding to decision making and such. And today I just want to showcase uh, two of these um, papers. The first video that you're going to see, and I want you to also hear, is you're going to be literally peering into the brain of a, of a zebra finch while it is singing. And so by simply looking at which neurons are being activated, which populations of neurons are being activated, you can predict the note that the songbird is going to produce. And that is really important for understanding how um, learning occurs, how memory occurs. The zebra finch is an excellent model for studying that. On the second side, you're going to be seeing a video where you're going to be peering into the brain of a mouse that is actually undergoing an epileptic seizure. And this is in collaboration with one of, our, uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies. Um, and what's really important to note here before I show you this video is the first few bursts of activities that you'll see before the seizure spreads in this region of the brain called the hippocampus, which is, again, involved in learning and memory. And those first few bursts are actually not detected by any other technology, for example, like by EEG. And they are 100% predictive that a seizure is going to be uh, occurring in the next few uh, seconds. So you see these first few bursts, which are actually predicted that there's going to be a seizure, a convulsion. And that's the actual convulsion uh, that correlates with the actual convulsion. 
And now this, this kind of knowledge gives drug companies and it gives neurostem companies the ability to actually tamp down the seizure based on that early predictive signal that has been detected. So beyond uh, sort of our commercial operations, it, we in Scopix views itself really as a sort of a catalyst of change uh, and a sort of um, an agent of really advancing science through collaborations. And in 2014, in February 2014, when President Obama issued his all hands on deck call to action for the Brain Initiative, we really asked ourselves how can a company at that time, 14 people, really make a contribution that is both authentic and impactful to something as ambitious as the Brain Initiative. And what we did was that we created a grant program that we called DECODE, that is uh, an acronym for deciphering, deciphering the Neural Circuit Basis of Disease. We put in $2 million of our assets and we created this grant program where we created these incline grants of our technology, the Envista system, and coupled it with training and partnership um, and we had an, uh, we solicited proposals. We had an NIH style study section with some of the world's leading experts, um, and they selected 13 proposals of the 45 that were received to receive these grants. And these uh, scientists are actually now fully trained. The labs are trained, um, and they are close to publishing in the probably the next six to seven months. Several of them. So that is the kind of. Um, a forward movement that can be generated when in Scopix, when a company like in Scopix, when the industry collaborates with um, researchers to support government initiatives. Um, so building on um, the Decode grant program, in Scopix will actually be hosting a summit, it's called a Decode Summit, on September 28th in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto, where we are going to bring top leadership from of course, academia, government, industry, uh, foundations, and also um, scientific journals and media to really understand the value of using circuit-based, neural circuit-based approaches for both understanding disease, but also for uh, the impact that these neurotechnologies will have in the development of next generation therapeutics for brain disorders. Um, we will also be uh, using the summit to really spark collaborations in a very tangible way between these different stakeholders for accelerating neuroscience discovery. And lastly, we will also be using the summit, and especially with all the scientific journals and the media outlets that will be present, to be able to better communicate the efforts of this entire enterprise here and to report the progress that is being made in a more effective and responsible manner. So to summarize, Inscopix is really a powerful example that shows the power of government, academia, and industry collaborations. And Inscopix really shows that it is possible to advance neuroscience discovery through entrepreneurship, and at the same time, also create economic activity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. So next up, we have Eric Caldwell, who is the Economic Development Director for the City of San Diego, one of my favorite cities. He's going to talk to us about his work there. Take it away. Thanks, Sean. Um, so you've gotten an opportunity thus far to hear about public-private partnerships and, and some of the amazing things that are occurring because of them. What I wanted to show you is the other side of the amazing things that are occurring because of them from a purely tactical economic development perspective. How is the public-private partnership really driving San Diego's economy? It, it, it's critical to everything that we do. So I'm going to give you a presentation. I'm going to move through it quickly because I, I want to get to the, the Q&A, and I know we have one more speaker. But fundamentally, the, the message that I'm delivering here today is that the secret sauce, the engine that drives innovation, the innovation economy in San Diego is really the public-private partnership. So that public-private partnership is, is giving us these three things that you see on the slide here. And this is what makes San Diego's economy tick. It's our talented workforce, the, that depth of innovation uh, ideas that we're seeing happen in San Diego, in that culture of innovation that 
springs up from the investments, the 700 plus million dollars of NIH funding that comes to San Diego on an annual basis. And really what that's driving is we're getting innovators like Dr. Lowe and, and his company in San Diego who's going to speak next that are really driving innovation in San Diego. It's not because we're making incentive agreements to attract talent to the region. Talent is coming to our region. It's gravitating to our region because of these public-private partnerships. And fundamentally, that's what's driving our economy forward. Also, San Diego's location and strategic uh, location on the Pacific Rim and our geography is also important as well. So overview of San Diego's economy, very much driven by manufacturing and innovation. Um, we also have a huge military sector, tourism sector, international trade and logistics. All of these things, what really drives that forward is our ability to bring industry, government, and our research institutions together. If you talk about that talent piece of what's going on in San Diego, a couple key things to take away. More than 60 world-class research institutions exist in San Diego, creating more than a $4.6 billion economic impact. If you look at just our life sciences industry, 34,000 jobs are created as a result of the life science industry, and that doesn't include the jobs that are created as a result of the research institutions that are supporting that growth. We have a UCSD, one of the largest engineering schools and best engineering schools in the, in the country, second largest concentration of workforce in science and engineering jobs in the United States, and on numerous indicators, we, including the OECD, Forbes magazine, we've been listed as the second most innovative city in the world. We talk about innovation from the perspective of funding. 1.6 billion in VC raised in 2015. The vast majority of that targeted towards life science companies. 40 plus incubators and accelerators. Again, how do we take that innovation that's coming out of the universities and out of our research institutions and commercialize it? We talked about the 60 plus research institutions. Again, the vast majority of those in life sciences. And then, of course, the, the number one most patent intensive region in the, in the United States and third most patent intensive region in the world. One of the things that we're starting to see in San Diego is we talk about life sciences. We have a white wireless health technology cluster in San Diego. You start starting to see the convergence of these technologies. And Kip had talked in his presentation about implantables and what that's doing in the neuroscience world. So we have a neuroscience cluster that's unparalleled anywhere in the United States in San Diego. And you're starting to see that cluster start to talk to the other innovation economy clusters like wireless. And they're coming up with technologies that are bringing together the best of both worlds and creating new sectors. You're starting to see cyber technology and cybersecurity become a bigger part of the conversation as it relates to life sciences, as we create more data about our human genomes and, and medical records. How do we protect that information and make sure that it isn't um, fall into the wrong hands? And just overall in San Diego, research and development is, is playing a huge, huge role in what we do. But I also, again, I'm moving through this quickly. I just wanted to close by talking a little bit about San Diego in general from the perspective of why that innovation is so important. What you're really seeing happen because of the investments that Congress is making in terms of NIH funding, because of the public-private partnerships that we're seeing with additional research dollars coming together, and because of what's happening is that there's a possibility to make additional investments in San Diego that are going to catapult and serve as a catalyst for future innovations. One of them that uh, Dr. Lowe is going to talk about next is, is Neurozone, and that's fundamentally why I'm here. Because when we think about where to make those investments, again, we want to make those investments where activity is actually happening. And there are a few places in the world and even fewer places in the United States where you're getting that concentration of good supportive government partners, a business community that's innovative and creative and the talent already exists, and you have the research institutions and academic institutions to support that innovation. And San Diego is one of those. And I don't want you to just to hear it from me. I want you to hear it from a company in San Diego called Illumina. Illumina is 
been ranked as one of the world's most innovative companies. And National Geographic came to San Diego and did a documentary about the innovation that's taking place in San Diego, ranked as one of the most innovative places in the world. And this is the chief medical officer for Illumina talking about why San Diego is such a great place for innovation. San Diego was settled by sailors from Spain. And successive waves of immigrants continue that inexorable expansion. Today, technology plays a crucial role in urban transformation, and a critical success factor is the development of tech-savvy talent. With one of the highest concentrations of tech companies in the US, it's proving a magnet for new talent. So why San Diego? There's a small number of places around the world that have been at the center of innovation. They all have a set of three characteristics. One, they have truly world-class academic research institutions. Two, they have world-class investors that are interested in entrepreneurship. And then the third thing, it actually has to be an attractive place to live. That's the secret sauce. It's a very informal place of openness, of feeling like it's a place that young scientists want to come and begin their careers. And San Diego is an incredibly attractive place to be for that. So again, I apologize for this shameless plug for San Diego, but I'm an economic <laughs> development director and that's what I do. But I really think that this is important to the conversation that we're having today. When we're, oh, and I fixed the PA system. <laughs> but I think that this is integral to the conversation that we're having today as we talk about innovation and what it takes to drive it forward. That money isn't the only factor, it's an important factor but fundamentally it's about creating ecosystems. And those ecosystems exist and are created and are supported by pu public-private partnerships. Again, with all of those partners coming together, and my job as an econ economic development director isn't to go out and steal companies from Austin or Silicon Valley and get them to come to San Diego, but it's to support innovators like Dr. Lowe and the work that he's doing to help create that ecosystem. And fundamentally, that's what's driving San Diego's economy. Thank you. Hope you all are taking a, a sigh of relief as, as, as I am. Thank you very much and uh, thank you again to our speakers for, for, for talking to the static and, and plug it on. That's, that's takes some courage. Um, I'm going to invite ne next speaker is, is Dr. Philip Lowe. Um, this is great because he's going to tie it all together with public private partnerships and the collaboration, the type of innovation ecosystems that result from those, from those uh, partnerships. So he is the founder and chairman, founder, chairman and CEO of NeuroVigil and a research affiliate at the MIT Media Lab. So, Dr. Love. So thank you very much um, to uh, the uh, American Association for Preventative Science, um, Sean Gallagher, um, Congressman Fata, uh, Aaron, um, Brendan Cheney, uh, who's been uh, terrific, uh, the wonderful group of speakers, all of you here for proving that you didn't come here only for the food, given that you've already eaten. Uh, and uh, I'm going to give you a mix of certain things. Uh, first of all, I'm not here to tell you that things are great because things are not so great. There are, there are a lot of problems um, that we need to address and there's a huge opportunity for government to step in. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about some technologies and then I, I will tie it together in terms of um, ways in which the government can interface with um, industry and academia in order to address some of these problems. So. Uh, Congressman Fata said uh, there are about 50 million people in America who have a, uh, a um, CNS disorder. It's actually 100 million, so you know, 
given that he's from one political party, maybe he didn't include the other one. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's two, two million people worldwide, 100 million uh, in the U.S. Um, if you look at California alone, if the population increases by about 30 percent, Alzheimer's itself will double. So it, it, it doesn't scale. Uh, we are getting Alzheimer's uh, earlier. At that rate, uh, by 2050, uh, the estimates are between 13.2 million to 16 million people in the U.S. will have Alzheimer's. Without adjusting for inflation, we're looking at $1.1 trillion um, every year that we're going to be spending on this disease. Currently, we spend, um, if, if we multiply the number of people who have Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, and depression uh, by the cost of care, it's a $179 billion bill per year. None of that, by the way, goes to research. This is just to take care of the patients. Uh, there is an indirect cost, which ironically is far bigger, um, the cost of the caretakers. So it's estimated for Alzheimer's alone, the indirect cost is $200 billion per year. Again, none of that goes to, to fund research. So um, uh, Pushkar spoke about, about uh, finches. So I'll start with that. And you, you may wonder how do, you know, how, how do finches tie in with Alzheimer's? So it's a long journey, but it's what, what, what I guess, you know, Larry King would call a grabber. So uh, this is a 2D section of a 3D manifold. Every dot corresponds to three seconds of brain activity, sampled one second at a time. Uh, dark blue corresponds to slow wave sleep, red corresponds to REM sleep, and this intermediate uh, pattern in, in uh, cyan is the first intermediate sleep state ever discovered in uh, outside of mammals. So this is a mathematical way of looking at data, which enables us to very quickly uh, make maps of the brain, not only animal brains, but also human brains, and I'll show you that, uh, so that we can actually sift through large amounts of data and, and come to conclusions. So here's one example. Uh, with this algorithm, we're able to show that uh, slow wave sleep was decreasing um, throughout the night, REM sleep was increasing throughout the night, and the space in between REM, REM epochs was decreasing. This is typical, typical mammalian uh, sleep. And if we look at uh, EEGs, so uh, these are these brain waves, we're looking at three second examples here from the same bird, same zebra finch. Um, you have all kinds of very interesting signals, including K complexes in D here, which have only been found before in uh, humans. So this work, um, uh, along with this over here, which shows that these brains are able to produce very high-frequency bursts, uh, led to something called the chemical declaration of consciousness, which was the first time that neuroscientists uh, acknowledged that there was a continuity across non-animal brains, um, and that it was really foolish for us to believe that uh, only human brains were capable of consciousness. Um, and uh, these non-invasive methods were also used in rodents, and we were able here to distinguish between uh, deep anesthesia in dark blue, light anesthesia in, in fuchsia, and then wakefulness um, in red. So if we look at human um, uh, sleep testing, uh, basically, uh, here's a major problem that we have. Uh, people are going to, there are about 70 million people in America who have, 40 to 70 million people have one kind of, of sleep disorder, um, 40 million with apnea, 70 million, uh, if you include insomnia. And uh, there are only about four, 4 million sleep tests every year. And the reason behind this is because the sleep test is actually very expensive and very uncomfortable. Um, what you see on the right here is a three-second snapshot from electrodes all over this person's head and body. So um, I invented an algorithm during my PhD, which enabled us um, to pretty much tease out different brain states using a single channel, a single EEG. Um, and here, so what you see is one person, every dot corresponds to 30 seconds, and there are different stages of brain activity throughout the night. We don't have to have all these sensors anymore. And we can do this at a very high resolution. So uh, this is now much higher resolution, so we can increase the bandwidth from a non-invasive probe. This is very important because it tells us that we can actually put a tiny little device like this one here, this is fresh out of the lab. This is the smallest non-invasive human brain monitor, and it's completely wireless. So you guys are all staring on, uh, at your phone. Um, I could be staring at your brain while you're staring at your phone because basically the, 
th this can carry a signal to your phone back to us and we can analyze it. Now NASA wants this on the space station so that we can actually do the first out of this world clinical trial uh, literally uh, on astronauts. So the idea is to actually take biomarkers of brain activity non-invasively instead of turning a few people into pin cushions, uh, analyze brain activity from millions of people using a very, very uh, easy to use probe. And so what this means is we're changing the, the transfer function. We're putting much less stuff on people and getting much more out of them. So how does this relate to some of these pathologies? So I'm going to show you a few vignettes. Um, it turns out that if you have Alzheimer's, if you have schizophrenia, if you have depression, when you're awake, you have Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, or depression when you're sleeping. And that is a treasure trove because it means that we can record hours of activity from people when the brain activity is much more dynamic um, and look at the effect I mean, and see if people are really sick. So I'll give you an example. The U.S. Navy was intrigued. Uh, and so as um, um, uh, Mr. Caldwell um, mentioned, you know, San Diego has a big uh, uh, Navy base there. And so they wanted to see what we could do for them. So we gave them a device. They loaded it up. We analyzed it. And here's what we saw. We said, okay, uh, this person had, you know, a slow wave contamination of stage two. So he's a candidate for traumatic brain injury. Uh, he has a very choppy... Um, REM sleep, so he's a candidate for PTSD. There's no overexpression of spindles in stage two, so probably uh, not only does he not have schizophrenia, but he may be treated by uh, an antidepressant. Um, and uh, finally, there is very little REM, so he's actually not depressed, so five things. And we were right about all five. And, and uh, when we asked why the Navy had actually drugged this person who wasn't depressed, they said, oh, he, he, was, he was anxious, that's why. We could do this with a single snapshot from the person's home. Um, Autism, you hear a lot about autism being on a spectrum. Because this technology is the same technology that we use on multiple continents, we can actually now gather a lot of data and see if autism is really part of the spectrum. Currently, based on our data, we think that there may be some very particular biomarkers of autism that are going to pop up and that it may not be as continuous as people think it is. Um, I'll show you another example. So Stephen Hawking asked me a few years ago to assist him with his communication needs. So now this is a waking application of our work. And so I said, fine, as long as this can co benefit other people. Um, and so we started the experiment immediately. And, he, and I said, you know, when do you want to start? He said, right now. So this is Stephen in his kitchen uh, in Cambridge wearing the device. And, you know, he, he wrote a very nice letter saying that he was uh, actually advising on the project. And this is what we found. This is actually rather fascinating. So on the left side, you have traditional methods. So basically, um, what you're seeing here is the following thing. The hot colors is when you're picking up the signal. And so Stephen here is resting. And here we're asking him to do something very cruel. We're asking him to imagine that he can move his hand. It's a pretty cruel thing to do to a person who uh, cannot do that. Turns out, if you use our algorithm, it turns out that we see high-frequency pulses when Stephen is thinking about moving his hand. Again, this is completely non-invasive and it's a single channel. And it turns out it's pretty specific. So when he's opening and closing his eyes, and so in green, this is when we, we ask him to begin the intent. Uh, in red is when we ask him to stop. You see these spikes. So he's actually physically opening and closing his eyes. Here, he's not moving anything. We are asking him to squeeze his right hand. He's not moving anything. He's paralyzed, but we can pick this up. Left foot. Right foot, left hand, etc. So this is all. This is you know. I mean, the present we were reading the mind. We're not reading the mind, but we're reading a person's intent to move. And that means that if, if a person is paralyzed, for example, you could feed these biomarkers to an exoskeleton and enable people to walk uh, again. So this is very exciting uh, stuff. This gentleman is Oginiero. Uh, he used to communicate um, with with his feet. He also has ALS, so he had about forty words per minute. Uh, with his feet, so you could see he was pretty quick on his feet. Um, there's a video, but I'll skip that in the, because we're on in the interest of time. But to, 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 to make a long story short, what you're looking at here, this is the very first word that a human being uh, communicated with a single non-invasive brain probe. And the word was communicate, and that was Augie. And that happened um, on May 21st, 2013 in Coronel Mall. So, you know, 
there, there are a lot of very exciting things uh, in the horizon. I have another video of Augie communicating, but again, um, I'm quite, I have to move here. Uh, let, I'll show you another example. This here is a gentleman who came to us uh, because he had gone to the ER and he wasn't feeling very well, and the ER just gave him an aspirin, and he asked to participate in the study. So we had to do the informed consent and so on. And, uh, and we looked at this data. It turns out that he was sleeping, on average, 1.4 minutes. The maximum amount of sleep that he had undisrupted was 18 minutes. So he was dying. And at the ER, they gave him an aspirin. Uh, he, by the time he had come to us, he had already gotten into a car accident. He could have you know, died or, or, or killed somebody else. Um, and it turns out that we were able to see what was going on. Again, we're a research company. We just made the data available to a lab that confirmed uh, these results. Uh, and then he was treated with light box, and now he's alive. Uh, but the point is, we need, to, we need to make neuroscience not reactive, but proactive. We need to record from people before they, are, they have symptoms in their homes and treat them right there and then. So we have miniaturized the technology. Um, and uh, when it comes to Alzheimer's, this is to, to answer the, the question, uh, there's been a very, very interesting set of studies in the last in the last year and a half or so. Uh, basically, it turns out that when you are sleeping, uh, you, the glial cells, the helper cells in the brain, are actually uh, moving CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, through the brain. So it appears that uh, when it comes to Alzheimer's, the amyloid load is being reduced. And that is actually very, very important. We know that people with Alzheimer's have terrible sleep. This is a hypnogram. And uh, even if you treat the apnea, uh, you can see that this person is waking up a lot during the night. You may have but still has very, very little to do sleep. So, you know, there is, there is now evidence uh, suggesting that there is um, a, a vicious cycle between beta amyloid uh, and, and poor sleep. So, um, what are we going to do? Well, as I said, we, we've miniaturized the, the, the technology. Well, this is Elon Musk wearing iBrain 1, this is iBrain 3. Um, but what are we going to do? Not everybody is as lucky to have you know, investors like Elon Musk or the kinds of rewards that we've won, etc. So how can we spur innovation uh, in a big way? And so I was um, uh, at the White House uh, on April 2nd, uh, when, um, well, it's 2014 now, uh, when we announced the, the Brain Initiative, uh, President Obama. And, and of course, as an innovator, I was complaining. I said, you know, this is not enough money. It's a great photo op, <laughs> but, 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 but if we're going to be serious about this, um, first of all, you know, we, we started with 100 million, that's good. It, it's, it's increased significantly thanks to um, uh, efforts, um, mostly by, you know, uh, Congressman uh, Fatah, Congressman McMorris Rogers, uh, Congressman um, McMorris Rogers. But, but uh, basically, here's the problem. If you look at the composition of the committee, initially they had uh, academics, giving money to academics. And I thought, well, you need uh, clinicians, you need engineers, you know, you need um, people like them so that we can actually have more translation going on between government, academia, and industry. So, so I, I caused so much problem that, uh, you know, people said, well, why don't you do something about it? I said, okay, that, that's, that's fine. So I said, well, let's create a Silicon Valley for the brain, Neurozone. And people got excited about it. So the idea is to actually create a physical park somewhere in the United States where we will bring the world's top innovators in brain science, whatever their creed, right, whether they are in academia, in government, or in industry, give them all the support that they need and, and reward through grants collaborations so that it is a very collaborative environment. Uh, and then as things hit the wire, as new technologies are being developed, we have the right people there to immediately translate these things into technologies. So an accelerator for the brain, that is the idea. So OSTP got very excited about this, the Office of Science and Technology at the White House. Um, Congress got very excited about this, Congressman Fatah, um, and again, Brendan has been doing some fantastic work here. Uh, Congressman uh, Scott um, uh, Roberts as well, uh, Peters. Uh, the Speaker of, of um, uh, the California State got, got excited and then Two particular places in California have said, why don't we build this here? So um, the mayor of San Diego 
Um, very much thanks to uh, Eric and, and the wonderful work he's doing. Um, uh, has recommended have recommended um, San Diego, and there's a great case to be made for San Diego. Um, it is the world's number one patent generators uh, generator. We have institution world class institutions everywhere, and um, Eric has actually located a site in San Diego. It's a beautiful property, 42 and a half acres, right by the Torrey Pines Mesa. And this is really the hotbed of innovation with life sciences in San Diego. This is where you have, uh, you know, Scripps and Salk and Sanford Burnham and UCSD. This, what you're looking at, could be the site of the U.S. Neurozone. But we're going to need uh, a federal component. We're going to need to pass a bill in Congress, a new technology bill, which will actually give a tax credit to newer technology investors if their uh, companies have a foot in the Neurozone, because that will reinforce the collisions and the collaborations. Another site that actually has uh, volunteered space uh, is uh, the Richmond Field Station, Northern California. This is with uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, there's about 100 acres uh, in, this, the, uh, in the Bay Area. And, um, I'll just say, say this one thing, and maybe half of, half of you will be upset that I'm saying that, but I, I feel that as a scientist, I have to say it. Um, innovation requires diversity. So that means that, you know, it's not an accident that uh, half the speakers uh, today, you know, were not born in this country. Um, and so there's a culture of inclusion that is extremely important, right? You need people with different backgrounds to be able to collide together. So. Uh, if this country is going to elect somebody who speaks a different language and who alienates, um, you know, minorities, women, um, Muslims, Mexicans, um, people with disabilities, I can guarantee you one thing. I can guarantee you that we will not be able to attract the kind of talent we've been attracting. I can guarantee you that a lot of people will not, um, who have actually moved here, will actually leave. I mean, I actually am one of them. So if that happens, then um, I will go to this place. <laughs> and, and I actually am meeting with the, with the new prime minister of Canada, with the premier of Ontario, uh, with the founder of BlackBerry, um, and with the minister of science and technology in Canada in a few days. Uh, they have located 2 million square feet uh, in Ontario for this project. Now, it might be that we will have a Neurozone in San Diego, in Northern California, and in Canada. But I don't want to come here to Congress and promise something if I know it in my heart, um, you know, as a scientist and as a human being, I'm not going to contribute directly as I have, or do, you know, uh, if the situation doesn't change. So, but the long shot is the following. Um, this is a quote by Rusty Gage, who is one of my PhD co-advisors. And um, he, his lab discovered uh, human stem cells, so, so adult stem cells. The idea is that all of you, no matter how bored you might be right now, uh, we're actually producing new brain cells. Uh, now, by the way, you'll produce more if you're more excited and you've got fit activity in your brain and you're exploring, but the point is, um, it's not downhill after 21. So no excuses. Um, but, 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 but what he said was, that basically, in 2006, he said, within 50 years, um, there will be a device out there that will record people's brain activity, whether they have schizophrenia, autism, depression, and Alzheimer's. And this device will be operable um, uh, wherever these people are. In other words, it will work in the wild, the wild being your home, being where you work, and so on. You will be constantly monitored. Right, so I can bet that probably 80% of you have had uh, your blood pressure checked in the last two years. There will come a time when I, when I will make the same bet about brain activity, and I will be right. And then there will come a time when I'll make the same bet about brain activity again, and I'll be wrong because we will be checking your brain every day. So um, uh, Rusty Gage uh, called me into his lab uh, a few weeks ago, and he said, "I heard you've been using this slide." And I have one complaint about it. What do you think it is? It won't take 50 years. We're doing it, right? We're building this. All right. Thank you very much for your time.
Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lau. Um, if I would, will all the speakers want to come up and they can take a seat? And uh, we are now open for questions, should anybody have any. Go ahead. things that come off the top of my head. The first is this stuff takes forever to get into human beings and treating patients. Um, and a lot of that has to do with a regulatory system that's very important for safety. But the other thing is that we know so little, but we're commodifying at such an early stage that creating a space where in early studies in human beings, where it's not all about IP, there's some sort of way to maintain your IP rights but share the data with other people. And that's what really has impressed me about more academic-led groups like Inscopics and my colleague over here is that they maintain that this is about collaboration and sharing, but this is industry. It has to be speaking to their needs and there has to be something redone about the IP law to make it more feasible for them to do that and still give profit to the shareholders. I think that we also need to, to, to find more collaboration. So we need to have actually fewer grants with much bigger uh, pocket sizes, uh, first sizes. And, sorry. And, and the idea would be um, to reward collaborations. Um, there are a few places that have been very successful with the collaborative model. For example, the ADNI, uh, which is you know the, the Alzheimer's Consortium. And many companies have actually agreed to share data. That is very, very unusual. But we will see more of those things if we have, you know, mega grants that actually uh, fund collaborations. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I have a question based on what you said about um, America's IP system not being really conducive to sharing. Are there any international models that you or any of your colleagues have looked at, like does the EU model for IP law generally fit more collaboration or between India or? I would love to have a good answer for that. I don't. Well, I think that um, with the the the, uh, the first to file um, transition, what has happened is that uh, there is now a migration from, um, from 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 pharma away from academia because they have less time on the patents. So uh, there are a number of great pharma companies who will look at very, very innovative approaches that are developed in academia, but, but, but by the time the, the proof of concept has been done, the clock has already been ticking. And so as a result, that particular mutation has made it more difficult for um, uh, public-private partnerships. Actually, I, I do now have an answer. Um, <laughs> just thinking about it, I mean, it, and my colleague spoke about this a little bit. Because the path is so long to get into human beings and actually get reimbursement and making profit, the fact that it's 20, your patent expires after 20, 25 years, that's often 15 to 20 years before you start making any profit whatsoever. So there are other models to lengthen that given that. But the other thing is for, for drugs, uh, they have different patent protection for rare diseases and disorders, et cetera. And the problem is for small markets that are, uh, they've created, at least in the drug world, some incentives and some unique patent protections to that aren't being applied to devices right now. And that's one of the reasons why nobody treats these horrible diseases and disorders that have a much smaller population because there's no incentive and the IP is part of the structure. I think those are two things that could be addressed quite quickly that would be conducive towards uh, growing, growing in this space and making it 
a better business case for it. Well, right. a, an easy way to do it would be to actually have a patent extension that is predicated upon FDA approval. Yes, that would be great. A comment and a question. Yeah. Comment about the patent laws. Uh, the U.S. patent laws are coordinated like all the uh, 150 whatever countries in the WTO through the WTO agreements. So, so the U.S. does not have the authority unilaterally to change the patent laws. In fact, the switch from uh, uh, first to invent, first to file was, was through that coordination. So, uh, whatever the U.S. does have, it's only one year, but you can get a uh, you know, preliminary application. My, my question is that you that uh, that uh, there was a, a number of speakers mentioned the, the human brain the, the human brain initiative with the White House sort of <coughs> years ago. The EU and Switzerland as well have a human brain initiative. Uh, and so my question is, uh, how much coordination is there between the U.S. brain initiative and the human brain initiative in, the, in Europe? Um, and um, and are they doing things better or worse than we are with regard to uh, the U.S. initiative? Pretty sure I'm the one who has to answer that mm -hmm. particular one. Um, so I uh, was the technology lead for the NIH por uh, portion of the, the Brain Initiative. Um, there is a lot of coordination. It's a, they're actually very different and have very different thrusts. Um, in Europe, what they're trying to do is model the brain in computer chips. So that's actually the thrust of the European Brain Initiative, is to take the understanding, but to actually model it in, um, to create better technologies were uh, focused much more on developing new tools to understand the brain and then create a collaborative structure to develop those findings into treatments that would uh, catalyze uh, new therapies for, for patients. So um, they're very complementary in terms of some of the knowledge that we get informs what they're doing. Um, the more we understand about the brain, the easier it is to create technology that mimics how the brain works, especially for things like pattern recognition, what have you. But also, creating a computer chip that does what the brain does is a fantastic test of what you know. Can you make it work? So th there's a lot of conversation about it, but they do have very distinct, and each of them, whether it's Swiss or actually uh, Japan has one, Australia has one, Canada is participating, they all have different thrusts and different things they focus on. Um, and then they're all coordinated to create a, a cohesive whole, or that's the hope. Just a comment, though. Was, I know that the Europeans got some criticism Yes. Project was too much of an IT project. Yes. And so I, I, I think they're changing it. Here it's, it's become a little bit more of a biology project, project as well. Yeah, that's they they got a lot of feedback that trying to create consciousness on a chip, we're not at the stage to even come close. Um, and so they're learning. Um, what the one thing that I was very impressed with what Francis Collins did at the NIH was they had a top down. So Europe had a top down driven. We're going to do this. What? This was ground up. This was pulling the communities on what the, the best we can do, and that became the targets for the brain initiative here. Um, and other countries are handling it kind of combinations. With regard to the Neurozone, how are you, um, are, do cities go to you and say, we want you to come here and provide the land, or, or do you go to cities, or how does that, is it random? How, how do you figure out possible locations? It's like dating. <laughs> So, so uh, there, there were a few cities that were obvious choices, San Diego being one of them. Um, and then uh, Waterloo actually, you know, uh, came to me and said, you should, you should consider doing a sister site in, in Canada. Um, and then when, uh, I was also looking at the Bay Area uh, because there is, you know, I, I think we have to be very careful to not be either all biology or, or, or either all AI, um, and especially for the kinds of technologies uh, that we are going after, because one thing I didn't mention in my talk is the technologies that we will fund um, have to be non-invasive, scalable, and human-based. So there has to be an appreciation for both the technology and the AI component. Um, and uh, Silicon Valley and the Bay Area has a lot to offer there as well. So. Uh, I had a meeting with uh, one of the key people at uh, Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Lab, and they suggested this site as well. It is very possible that there would be also a site on the East Coast, maybe Philadelphia or Boston, uh, but it is important that at the onset, that this is at least one physical area that people will gravitate to, 
so that um, we can actually accelerate the rate of collision. And that is conducive to innovation. So we have just enough time for one more question. Are you concerned that <clears throat> development of this technology will bring about new government regulation uh, of the whole industry? For example, I was noticing your description of where you're going to site the new uh, facility, and it reminded me of the Olympic bids. Uh, clearly, there's be some implications to this in athletic performance, and there are military implications. Are you concerned that governments may decide this is too important a technology to let entrepreneurs compete competitively control? Well, government doesn't really have a choice. We're build, as entrepreneurs, we're building it, and we're inviting government to be part of it. So. Uh, government is not calling the shots. Uh, the government has a chance to be part of this project. Uh, I think that you know uh, that you could have made the same argument, for example, about the Human Genome Project, where there was a very huge private component and a government component, and uh, you know we did not completely degenerate into into eugenics. Um, that being said, that being said, uh, there are some concerns about data privacy, right? So. Uh, and, and it is one of the, um, in, in the Canadian bid, uh, they pretty much said, you know, we, Patriot Act doesn't apply here, and we could make sure that all the brain data that is being collected from millions of people, and at some point billions of people, uh, is going to stay completely uh, locked. So I think there is a, there's, there's a data uh, privacy concern. Uh, but at this stage, we want government to play uh, a positive role, as it has ha had with the Internet and the Human Genome Project. Uh, and I think the regulations will come as they are needed.